Hi everyone, I'm Bob Abbey, Adult Services Librarian for the City of Forest Grove, and I want to welcome you to Adult Summer Reading 2020. Because of the ongoing coronavirus outbreak, we're doing things a little differently this year, but please know that we're committed to providing you with a fun and engaging summer reading experience. Many of you participated in our exploration last year of the novels of Willie Vlaughton, and thanks to the response we received, we're continuing the tradition of making summers all about the work of a single writer. This year, we're turning our attention to the other side of the state and focusing on the historical fiction of Jane Kirkpatrick. Jane is the New York Times and CBA award-winning and best-selling author of more than 30 books, including Everything She Didn't Say, All She Left Behind, a Light in the Wilderness, and a Sweetness to the Soul, as well as the two books we've selected for our community reading activities, This Road We Traveled, published in 2016, and One More River to Cross, published in 2019. We'll have extra copies of both those titles in print, ebook, and audio formats for you to select, place on hold, and download. In addition, we're excited to announce that Jane will be taking part in a very special virtual event with us on Tuesday, September 15th, to celebrate the publication of her next novel, Something Worth Doing, which chronicles the life of Oregon writer, newspaper editor, and women's rights advocate, Abigail Scott Dunaway. We'll have more details on that event as we get closer to the date, so stay tuned. And finally, Jane and I will be recording a series of book discussion sessions throughout the summer, which we'll post on the library's Facebook page and our YouTube channel starting later this month. Now, to tide you over until then, I want to share the first part of a discussion I had recently with Jane in which she talks about her background, her approach to writing, and why the West resonates with her so much. I hope you enjoy this brief introduction to Jane Kirkpatrick and can join us again next week for part two. I'd like to start off by just um, having you talk a little bit about your background, how you got to the um, path of writing. It was very accidental. <laughs> um, I, I always liked words. I mean, that was my my entree into writing of any kind, but I love words. I love the sounds of words. I loved how funny they were. One of my earliest memories is I grew up on a dairy in Wisconsin and um, my sister told me that these little things that were fluttering around some mud holes when we would go to get the cows were butterflies. And I can remember saying to myself and then to her and laughing and say, well, no, that can be a butterfly because I knew what butter was. We had a dairy and I knew what a fly was and it wasn't that thing that was floating around. And so words have always fascinated me, their origins, how, what they sound like, things like that. Um, and I, growing up, I wrote what I called wretched little poems that, you know, were really kind of morbid. <laughs> I mean, you know, just strange things about dead flowers, <laughs> whatever. Um, and then I got into school and teachers were incredibly kind to me about the way I wrote things down. And that really became a gift throughout my, um, my high school and college years was uh, encouragement by teachers who said, you know, you have something that's different. Um, I didn't really know what that was. And, and I started out as a major in English in um, at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and then got diverted into a program called Communications and Public Address. And that's what I graduated in. Um, and then I got hooked into social work. Um, it was a totally different direction. And, um, but in some ways it's not because I think both writing and, and, um, and social work are healing, mental health issues are healing activities. So um, I would be invited at the agencies I worked for to write the annual report because they said I could make it sound interesting. <laughs> and so, um, so again, I got these sort of reinforcements about writing. 
Um, but it wasn't really until my husband and I decided to leave Bend at that time and move to what I call Rattlesnake and Rock Ranch, uh, which is along the uh, north, north central part of Oregon on the lower John Day River. And um, I did not know what on earth I would do there. And this sort of inner voice at one point said, well, right. And so I took a couple of classes at the local community college and um, and was able to get published nonfiction pieces, mostly like essays or feature articles for Private Pilot and some things for Mother Earth News and so on. And that's what got me into thinking, well, that's something I could do at the end of this dirt road, seven miles from our mailbox. And that sort of, eventually I wrote, uh, the first book I wrote was, um, our memoir called Homestead. It was about leaving Bend and moving to that ranch and we were there 27 years. So, and after that came out in 91, then um, I read about in a historical society, this wonderful couple that I thought was just fascinating and I wanted someone to write her story, but I couldn't find very much information about her. I could find things about her husband, her brother, her father, and if, they'd had sons, I could have found out things about them. But, um, and so I leapt into writing fiction. Um, I, I read a quote from um, Virginia Woolf, who said that women's history must be invented, both uncovered and made up. And that gave me permission to put words into the mouth of this woman and to risk um, trying to tell her story when there were so many empty spaces. So that became A Sweetness to the Soul, which was my first novel, and it got some national recognition, and then I just kept going. So that ended. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, and you also, uh, I want to just kind of bring in uh, another aspect of your um, background, which is that you have uh, worked on the Warm Springs Indian Reservation. Uh, can you talk right. a little bit about that? So that was, um, I was there for 17 years and still have great connections with people there. Um, what, when, when we started our homestead, we discovered that homesteading was really pretty expensive. <laughs> and, and it was pretty clear we'd both quit our jobs and one of us was gonna have to get a job. And I had worked with a man um, when I was the director of the mental health program in Bend uh, years before that, and they were looking for someone to help set up a program called Early Intervention on the Warm Springs Reservation. And it was going to just be one day a week for a year, and it turned out to be between one and three days a week for 17 years. And it was really, professionally, it was the most challenging, but also the most gratifying work I did there. I worked mostly with the families of children that had disabilities who were under the age of five. So um, it's been, that was just really a remarkable time for me. And it's really where I started writing because I didn't have any distractions. I, we had a little trailer we took up there and, um, close to the reservation. And I started just getting up really early in the morning, like four and five um, and being at the computer and writing for two or three hours in the morning and then going to work. And initially I thought that would tire me from the work I was being paid to do. But it turned out that the writing um, just um, exhilarated. It just gave me this great sense of, I've already accomplished something today. Um, and so I had more energy and I could do research at night. Didn't have to worry about feeding my husband. He was up by himself, taking care of himself. So it was really, um, so for two days, for two nights a week, I had the perfect setting. And then um, I, I just kept getting up early and I still get up early to write for two or three hours. Um, and sometimes the whole day, but mostly now it's two to three hours in the morning and then I can take care of um, real life. <laughs> I have to leave the 1800s and come into real life. <laughs> and did you find that um, working in those different types of environments um, gave you some insights into characters and into human nature that you were able to then take and infuse into your writing? Oh, always. Um, I think particularly at Warm Springs because it was, it was a place where every single day I was, I encountered some experience that reminded me that the way I see the world isn't the only way to see the world, and and that's certainly a um, a uh, 
an impetus for lifelong learning. I mean, is to remind yourself that, oh, there is another way to look at this. Um, and, uh, and I also think the idea of story, I mean, um, the Warm Springs people are an oral community and so they told stories and they're wonderful storytellers. And that really um, fed my understanding of what a story really is about. Um, I remember one day the janitor at our building, he was a, um, an Indian man, Warm Springs man, and he told me that when my books came out, he said, I buy five copies of them and I keep one for myself. I give one to my wife, one to my grandson, and the other two went to nephews. He said, then we get together one night a week and we read them out loud to each other. And he said, that's how we find ourselves inside your story. And to me, that was just, I mean, I couldn't have had a better review <laughs> in anything. I mean, it was, and it was such a clarifying moment of people want to find themselves inside these stories. And to do that, I have to be able to step away from myself and listen to what it is that's being told out in the universe and pay attention to the story. Mm -hmm. You, uh, you do spend a lot of time in the 19th century. I do. <laughs> and uh, you mentioned that you're from Wisconsin, and a lot of your fiction really focuses on the large geographical area of the West, uh, right. people coming to the West. Um, what was it about the 19th century that resonated with you, and what is it about the West in particular that you find appealing? Um, I think the the appeal... The appeal of the West, um, in addition to the landscape itself, which sort of speaks to um, bigness and openness and challenge. Um, and I think Wallace Stenger one time wrote that, he said, there, uh, there can be no pessimism in the West. It's the native land of hope. And I love that idea that there was this, and that's really, besides the landscape, the physical landscape, it's the idea that there were hopeful things could happen in the West. There, you could change things. Um, and for me, I, I came West initially to visit my sister. She had moved out here in the 60s to um, first to the Willamette Valley and then to Central Oregon. And every Christmas from the time in high school, my parents would drive out there in the winter. We would drive four days to get to Junction City, Oregon spend three days with my sister for Christmas in the rain, <laughs> and then we drive back. Um, and one, the summer after I graduated from high school, I spent working in a berry field in Oregon. And that's when I fell in love with the, the part of Oregon that was without bugs, <laughs> you know, um, and the climate and it's, you know, it was, it was just a wonderful place. Um, and when I graduated from um, university and got my master's degree in clinical social work, um, my husband then had applied to the University of Minnesota and for a PhD program. And he said, if, if I don't get in, we'll go West because I'd always wanted to go there. And, um, and so we did go West and um, he and I later divorced and I met my current husband and have been together for 44 years. So, so the West now, of course, holds me because it's had all these years of um, memory and experience and, and it um, supported making major changes. I mean, leaving a, leaving a job as a mental health um, administrator and, you know, moving to Rattlesnake and Rock Ranch, um, the, the West sort of lures you, lured me anyway, and at the same time, it's sustained with its um, bigness and its openness and it's willing to allow people to do new things. Mm -hmm. And certainly for women in the 1800s, that was the case. Uh, I think it's one of the reasons a lot of the history of the West is written by men and you get that picture of you know, independence and all that sort of thing um, that went on for men. But it was also true for women. I read one where that said that Willa Cather was the first woman to write about a relationship of a, of a woman to the landscape. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that I find that really interesting. And I think that's one of the places and one of the things that has intrigued me about writing about real historical women um, is identifying, you know, what is it about the landscape? What is it about the West that um, sustained them and that helped them you know, find the passions in their lives. Mm 